Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. You're about to listen to a historical episode of Dark Poutine. After episode 149, you will find Scott is no longer with the show. In an effort to maintain continuity and offer listeners as many episodes as possible, we are leaving the episodes in which he co-hosted intact. Thank you. Welcome to Dark Poutine. I'm Mike Brown, creator and host. With me as usual is my good friend and co-host Scott Hemingway. Say hello, Scott. Oh, hello, you you adorable human beings. Oh, they're adorable yeah. this week. Yeah. They, that's, well, that's have you nice. seen them? Have you seen them? Some of them. I've seen every single listener. What? And they're all adorable. Yeah. Wow. I yeah. wish I could say thank you to every single listener. I think I just did. <laughs> oh, I see what you did there. The views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate Global News, nor their parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Listener discretion is strongly advised. We're not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We're two ordinary Canadians chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double and a Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. Om nom nom nom. I'm all hopped up on sugar, Scott. Are you? Oh my gosh, I just ate two bowls of apple cinnamon Cheerios. Oh, good man. And I'm stoned. Good man. Like, I shouldn't have done that before I just, the show. I just had, like, a uh, Tim Hortons bacon breakfast sandwich. There were wedges. Oh. And an orange juice. So, I mean, there's some sugar involved. Yeah, so I'm, I'm quite hopped up. Oh, God. I mean, on, on the sugars. Oh, I, I should have consumed more sugar. <laughs> Words I rarely ever say. There you go. Well, yeah, because you're a sugar guy. Because I'm usually consuming sugar at all times. This is episode 91. Is it going to be an uplifting, cheerful, uh, let's all do cartwheels together episode? No. Oh, fuck. <laughs> Great. It's it's, uh, it's actually something that's been in the news recently. Oh. And although these crimes covered this week happened in late 1984 in Cranbrook, British Columbia... They're making the rounds again here in the Lower Mainland and across BC. Why? The perpetrator, a dangerous serial offender, is currently in the midst of supervised Mm -hmm. day releases into the community of Abbotsford for, quote, self-development purposes. And we're not sure what that could mean. It could mean going to counseling or a 12-step meeting of some sort. But some fear this man will take one of those opportunities to escape and possibly reoffend, or worse yet, get full release back into the community if he's a good boy. Um, I'm already doing cartwheels. Yeah. This is exciting. I don't think it... Uh, no. I don't think that's appropriate. No, it's not. Uh, that was just, It was called sarcasm. This is the story of the 410 murders, Deneen Worms and Brenda Hughes. Hmm. Deneen Worms, who'd been born in Penticton, British Columbia, moved away from the interior with her family when she was just a child, Mm. and they moved to Port Alberni on Vancouver Island. We've mentioned Port Alberni a few times recently. Yeah, I don't know much about it. It's a port. Uh, And and it's in Alberni? Yeah. (laughs) That's what else do we need to know? In Port Alberni, Deneen attended Beaver Creek and Neal's schools. She became involved at her local 4-H club. Oh, she was mentioned in the Alberni Valley Times on numerous occasions as a standout. So what the, what are the 4-H's? Uh, home, hearth, health, and... Handsome? Hitting? <laughs> Heckling? Hobby? Maybe? 
I don't know. Henceforth. Maybe. Someone will tell us. Yeah, I'm and sure. We, and we're not making fun of 4-H because I think it's a great organization. Yeah, I've never heard anything negative about it. No. In 1976, Deneen raised a goat and took first place in her class, but he couldn't find any reference to other contenders. So it looks like Deneen was the only one raising a goat that year. It sounds familiar like somebody <laughs> who won their division all the way to yeah, I, the provincials you t- in wrestling. I, 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 I'm picking up what you're putting down. Yeah, yeah. I, when I made it to the BC finals in wrestling in my weight division. Why? Uh, because in the semifinals, there was nobody in my weight division. There you go. Mm-hmm. And I then proceeded to lo- lose every match. Yes. So I thought that would be bring a little giggle to you. Yeah. In a 1977 article, I found a photo of a grinning 13-year-old Deneen holding a model boat with two other home and hobby makers in 4-H. This sounds lovely. A 1978 article mentions Deneen's involvement with the local 4-H horse riding club. So she began to... Just love like, horses. It sounds like a, a lovely child. Yeah, it's really interesting. We, usually we don't have a lot of background on somebody's uh, childhood. Yeah. But because she was so involved in her community and involved in these events, mm-hmm. there was a lot of occasion for her to be in the newspaper. So I found quite a quite a bit about her. Good, because I, I, I love to know as much as possible about uh, the people we're covering. It just it paints a picture. In 1979... The newspaper published three of Deneen's poems. One is titled Horses, outlining her awe of a beautiful and powerful animal. Another poem is called Simply Canada and shows Deneen's pride in the splendor of our beautiful country as well as our friendly nature. Hmm. It finishes with the line, I'm proud to be a Canadian because you see, Canada is the only place I want to be. That's lovely. Yeah. Hmm. Deneen's third poem was called Serenity Broken. And it showed thoughts of a maturing young woman concerned for the environment. And it goes this way, quote, A cool wind blows in the enchanting little valley. Jumping fish break the silence. A place where humans have not yet trod. Huge green mountains towering high. Protect it from human's harm. The shore is so desolate and dense. Slowly changes with the day. Man comes with axes and saws. Soon the serenity is broken. End quote. That's uh, for 1979. Like, that's pretty... Well, uh, she was... She would have been about 16 at the time. Yeah. 15 or 16. That's still... For that for that time, you know, there wasn't as much uh, earth awareness as there is now. And no. With the environment and stuff. So that's like... Just seems like... A, like that's the so kind of kid good. that would make a parent proud. Yeah. In 1980, Deneen was quoted in brief articles uh, where students were asked to give their opinions. In one, Deneen spoke on the importance of school as it, quote, prepares you for life outside the home. A class full of students is better than one person trying to learn alone, end quote. Hmm. She also spoke about the hope for a quick resolution between the school board and striking workers so the children affected could get back to their studies. A very socially conscious child. Yeah, well, I say he, I wrote here that uh, I think she could have become a teacher or even mm-hmm. a politician. Because she'd even won an award as an orator, so a public speaker. Maybe she would have been a rapper. Who kn- <laughs> I don't know. She's great with the... Uh... I, I, don't think, I don't think it was leading toward rap. I think it was more leading toward becoming the mayor. Well, that also would be great. I guess the mayor would be a good rap name, wouldn't it? <laughs> Whoa, it should be. There you go. We'll never know, though. In 1981, Deneen moved to Cranbrook to live closer to her maternal grandfather, Max Mm. Herndl, after she completed school at A.W. Neal's secondary in Port Alberni. Her family thought Cranbrook was a safer place for a young woman to set out on her own. However, it was here, just over two years later, that Deneen Marie Worms would be brutally murdered. So, an interesting thing, I remember when I grew up, Lived in Clearwater. Well, I grew up there, but when I was born in Clearwater, I always remember my parents telling me that our neighbors, their last names were the Worms, because that was something we always told because we thought it was funny. Hmm. So interior well, these, BC, I wonder if there's... Well, I don't know. I don't hmm. know if they're related to these worms. I don't know. But uh, 
I didn't want to make fun of a last name, but it is no. an interesting last name, and I'm not sure. Well, that's why it stands out to me, because that's why we used to always, yeah. like, you know, when you had your neighbors with the name The Worms, like it. It's interesting. Yeah. It, yeah. Like, so, I'm, I'm wondering what nationality, what, yeah, and what heritage Worms is. And I don't know how common it is. And mm. so it just makes me wonder instantly, like, oh, wow. Could, could we, have been some relatives, yeah. yeah. Cranbrook, according to Wikipedia, is a city in southeast British Columbia, Canada, located on the west side of the Kootenai River at its confluence with the St. Mary's River. And if you look at a map of British Columbia, Cranbrook is the largest residentially populated area in the southeast corner of the province. So very southeast. I've been there. I spent some time there. It's a beautiful place. I've never Re been. Uh, one of my best friends from back in the day... Uh, him and his wife are from there, and they got they got married there, so I went there for the wedding. Oh, nice. Beautiful, beautiful area. So Cranbrook was, the area was originally settled by the Tunaha indigenous people, also called Kootenai, as is the extended local area, and the English folk called them the Kootenai, because that's how they mispronounced Tunaha, I guess. <laughs> Completely different. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, so, uh, are you Brian? No, my name's Paul. Like, okay, like Paul. Very, yeah. like this, very, yeah. Yeah. So the colonials began to arrive in the late 1800s, and Cranbrook was incorporated as a city in 1905. Quote, some of the major industries include mining, forestry services, trades, and health care. According to the Cranbrook City website, the population is now just over 20,000 people, and, quote, Cranbrook is a thriving community with a proud history and an exciting future nestled in a broad open valley between the Rocky Mountains to the east and the older Purcell Mountains to the west. Cranbrook is surrounded by world-class scenery, recreation and wildlife. Mild winters and warm sunny summers characterize our beautiful mountain environment. Sounds about right. Interesting. Yeah. And Cranbrook is home to a surprising number of retired NHLers. Yeah, yeah. So among them are the Niedermeyer brothers, Rob and Scott, yep. as well as probably the most famous one, Hall of Famer and multiple Stanley Cup winner, Steve Iserman. Yeah. Crazy, eh? Yeah, it's, it's weird. such a small, uh, you know, there's probably uh, half the people in BC have never even heard of Cranbrook. And yet here's like- Well, if you listen to Hockey Night in Canada, you've heard of Cranbrook because Don Cherry will say their names <laughs> once in a while. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, Deneen Worm's life was just beginning there in Cranbrook. She'd gotten a job at a local nightclub as a part-time cleaner. She'd moved in with a club's DJ, Roger Laverne. Hmm. He was in need of someone to share the rent. On the night of October 9th, 1984, Deneen and her pal Sandra Nightingale went out for a girls' night on the town. They went to a bar called Misty's where they had something to drink, and then to Duffy's Cabaret. Sandra, Deneen, and three other women participated in a wet t-shirt contest at Duffy's. Deneen didn't win, but she appeared to be having a great time. Deneen borrowed some money from Sandra and left to go to Watts, another cabaret in Cranbrook. Deneen's roommate, Roger Laverne, worked as the DJ at Watts Cabaret. He said that she came into the bar at approximately 1.30 in the morning, the 10th of October, and was leaving at about 10 minutes to 2. She was clearly not sober. Deneen was stopped by Roger and his friend. They told her to wait around 10 more minutes and they'd walk home with her. Deneen insisted she wanted to leave right away, and she did just that. Deneen Worms was never seen alive again. When Deneen left the bar, she was wearing blue jeans, a white shirt, a red and orange quilted vest with a floral print and running shoes. She had short, dark brown, curly hair, brown eyes, and a playful smile. She was 5 foot 3 inches tall and weighed about 140 pounds. Her friends and family were concerned right away, wondering where she'd gone when she didn't show up at home. Had she run off with somebody, or had something awful happened? Just over six days later, the people looking for Deneen got their answer. It was the worst case possible. I found the details from the crime scene in Robert D. Keppel's book, Serial Violence, Analysis of Modus Operandi and Signature Characteristics of Killers. Keppel is probably the most famous for his book, Riverman, in which he entreats the help of incarcerated killer 
Ted Bundy to assist with the capture of the Green River Killer, Gary Ridgway. To paraphrase, at 6 p.m. on October 16, 1984, some locals went to a gravel pit six miles away from Cranbrook to do some target shooting. There, lying on her back under a tree, left leg tucked under her right, right arm above her head, naked save for white gym socks with two red and one blue stripe, was the body of Deneen Worms. Her killer had covered Deneen's head with small wooden boards and a bit of a tree stump, while the rest of her was left open to the elements. The cool weather at that time of year had preserved her well, though. The autopsy revealed that Deneen had been shot twice at close range with a small caliber shotgun, a 410. The first shot, the fatal one, had gone through Deneen's left hand and into the left side of her face. The second shot was done coup de grace style and had entered Deneen's skull near the right ear. Scrapes on Deneen's back indicated she'd been dragged to where she'd been found. Number 5 shotgun pellets and brain matter over 20 feet away confirmed this. Lastly, there was semen from an unknown male in her vagina. A search of the roads nearby later turned up Deneen's purse and shoes a few kilometers away. Deneen had just told her folks in the Thanksgiving weekend phone call that she was looking forward to coming home to Port Alberni for the Christmas holiday. A prayer service was held for Deneen on October 24th at Notre Dame Roman Catholic Church in Port Alberni, and a funeral was the next afternoon. Some of Deneen's poems were read at the service. Deneen Worms was described by her mother in an Alberni Valley Times article published on October 26, 1984. Quote, she was a very alive girl, a vivid girl. She loved music and dancing, her mother said. She was a friendly person. She never held a grudge against anybody. End quote. Uh, the means of death just <clears throat> stands out to me. A very, very violent, a shotgun to the face. A 410, which is a very small caliber. Mm. But yes, it is a, it is a very violent way to be dispatched. And judging by the fact that the initial one went through her hand and into her face, it sounds defensive. She was well aware of what so, was going on. So, I mean, on. that this, uh, this is what I hate about humans. So this is a sexual assault yep. followed by a murder to cover things up. But the fact that he left her out yeah, not, to, be, to be found so easily is, yeah. is disturbing. Yeah, not not uh, he did not try to cover his tracks that well at all. He covered her face with some boards, but that was probably because he didn't want to look at. I, what uh, yeah, done. I was just going to say that's more out of uh, guilt and yeah. remorse yeah. than it is uh, remorse for himself. Yeah, not well, for her. Remorse in the like a lot of the times when a victim's face is covered or something that that it has a like oh my god what have I done oh oh I can't look at like she, oh she's looking right at me and there they'll cover the face so it is about them it's yes. protecting him yeah. yes if anyone knew anything at all about Deneen's murder no one was talking police rounded up and interviewed anybody who'd been out and about that night people who'd been at Duffy's and everyone who knew Deneen frustratingly. They came up empty on every lead. As we've talked about before, small town murders typically either stem from an escalation in domestic violence or the perpetrator and victim are well known to one another and there may have been some kind of beef between them. Mm -hmm. This was not looking like the case relating to Deneen Worm's murder. This was shaping up to be one of the most difficult kind of cases to solve, a stranger on stranger killing. Yep. The fact that this case involved what appeared to be a sexual assault on a young woman prior to her murder was very concerning. Once this kind of creep develops a taste for this kind of thing, it's possible they'll do it again. People in Cranbrook and the surrounding areas were afraid. Young women started traveling in packs. Mm -hmm. The quest for answers dragged on into late December of 1984. So two months later, yeah. Brenda Lee Hughes was a pretty brown-haired, hazel-eyed 16-year-old with a friendly smile. She was 5'7 and weighed about 120 pounds. According to an article in the Vancouver Sun, quote, the statement beside Brenda's face smiling from the 1983-84 yearbook says, 
Quote, Brenda's ambition is to survive the weekends and make it to school on Monday. Her most embarrassing moment was tripping and falling in front of a cute guy. The article went on to quote a family friend who noted, Brenda was a friend and peacemaker in her family. He also said she was the one who liked to sit at home and read, but she could be a joker, the socializer. She was her brother's shadow and daddy's girl, end quote. <sighs> Brenda was one of the girls afraid to walk the streets of Cranbrook alone after Deneen's murder. The killer switched things up this time. He came to her. Oh, shit. Okay. On the morning of December 30th, 1984, Brenda Lee Hughes' family were on their way to church. She was going to stay home and have a shower. At about 10.45 a.m., Mr. Raymond Hughes, her dad, along with his wife Helen and their son Daryl, left home in the quiet Cranbrook neighborhood. As they said goodbye, Brenda's family noted that she was wearing a white Angora sweater and pink sweatpants. The door they exited from to the carport, as was the practice when someone was still home, was left unlocked. At 12.30 p.m., the Hughes family car pulled into the carport and the family went in through the same door they'd left from, still unlocked. The family dog who greeted them at the door had blood on its face and head. They called for Brenda, but no answer. It was Helen Hughes who found her daughter lying face down, naked on the sofa. There was blood everywhere, her hair still wet from a shower. Helen screamed, which brought her son Daryl to the scene, and Ray soon followed. A white pillow with two shotgun holes singed into it lay on the floor beside Brenda's body, clearly used to muffle the sounds of gunshots that had killed the young girl. From Robert D. Keppel's book, Serial Violence, quote, Brenda was face down with her left side visible. Her head was resting against the armrest pillow on the couch. Her left arm was bent, with her hand near her shoulder, her right hand was resting on top of her buttocks. She had sustained two gunshot wounds to the side of her head. Gunshot wound number one was an entrance wound to the left ear area. Plastic wrapping, cloth wadding, and lead pellets of the shotgun shell from a 410 shotgun were found inside her head. Gunshot wound two was located about two centimeters above gunshot wound one. It was near contact in type. Lead pellets, plastic wrapping, and cloth wadding from a 410 shotgun were found inside the victim's head with that one. There were no exit wounds. As in the Worms case, no shotgun casings were found at the scene. A small, fresh bruise was found at the posterior left mid-calf area. Semen was found in the vaginal area. End quote. Oh, I'm pretty disgusted, horrified, angry. And, I, you know, yeah. A small town, two months apart, same style of death, 410 shotgun. Mm -hmm. It would be impossible to not think related. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Throughout the house, there were small uh, smears of blood left by the dog on the wall. He'd obviously been checking on her oh, afterward. Jesus. And uh, there was one sign of a bit of a struggle and there was a dent in the drywall in downstairs so mm. perhaps she had been kicking or they had been scrapping and can you think of anything worse as a parent to come home and find your child murdered in your home no like, i cannot like i can't even process how that would feel i don't want to process how that would feel no her brother was so upset he couldn't even pick up the phone to yeah. call 911. Yeah, the clothes that Brenda was last seen wearing were on her brother's bedroom floor at the foot of the bed. Daryl noticed his blue bedspread was messed up. He'd made the bed before uh, they left, and he knew Brenda never used his room for anything, especially undressing. Oh, shit. Three dollars were missing from his wallet on the dresser. Helen's purse was found open on top of the toilet in one of the bathrooms, and it had been rifled through. A gray metal lockbox was missing from the floor of the master bedroom closet. I, I, I do not think uh, theft was the modus operandi here. I don't think that was, I think that's like the, the after, motive. Yeah, I think that's the afterthought. Yeah. 
So you don't think that theft was the motive? No. Modus operandi and motive are very different. <laughs> they spelt different. Yeah. It doesn't mean they are different. We're going to get into MO. The shotgun pellets in Brenda's case were number six, contrasting the number five shot in Deneen's murder. So, um, Is that size? Size, Is it the size of the, of the, shot. the pellet? Okay. Yeah. Uh, both, though, had come from a 410. The murders of Brenda and Deneen were very similar, except in the change in MO. One murder took place after what appeared to be abduction and rape in a remote location where Deneen's body was dumped. Brenda's murder had happened inside her own home. Was this escalation, or perhaps our killer was learning? Well, I think probably both. Police were guarded about making any public statements linking the two crimes until they had enough evidence. Privately, though, they surmised that if they found the man responsible for Brenda's murder, he'd be good for Deneen's, too. Yeah, without a doubt. So, uh, back to the shotgun. Yep. Can one shotgun shoot different sized... Uh, pellets? Pellets? Yes. So but, you can... But only one size shell will fit into it. Okay, but so but you can just buy a different... Yeah. A, a sh the same size shell with a different size pellet yes. in it. Okay. Like, for example, with a 12 gauge, you can buy a 12 gauge with birdshot, uh, which is very tiny, little pe pellets, mm -hmm. or with double lot buck, which are the size of 38 caliber bullets. Okay. All right. So, so I'm I'm just trying yep. to visualize in my head can this be done with the same murder weapon? Yep. Okay. 100%. A break came right away. Oh, good. Between 12:15 and 12:25 on the day of the killing, the neighbor across the street from the Hughes, Harry Walker, was sitting at his kitchen table. According to a Vancouver Sun article, Harry, quote, saw a man with long dirty blonde hair walk out of the Hughes residence and stop at the sidewalk. He turned left, but before he did, he looked across the street, said Harry. I seen him, and he seen me. Hmm. Because, End quote. Yeah, because if you think about the time from when the parents left and came back, I don't know, I don't, I don't, I didn't even, I think it was like two, or one hour and 45 minutes or something. And so I'm guessing this person was aware of the family, was aware of when they were leaving. He didn't just like, oh, let me knock on this door. Well, or did he may have broken it? No, okay. I want to, I want to find out. The young man that Harry Walker had seen was quickly identified as 22 year old Terrence Wayne Burlingham. Walker had given cops a detailed description of Terrence himself, as well as what he was wearing. Hmm. Interestingly, at the time of both killings, Burlingham was on mandatory supervision after being convicted of multiple B and E's in the area. Hmm. His probation terms were that he had to check into the police station weekly, which he'd been doing without fail. Yes, the man who was about to be accused of not only one, but two brutal sex slayings had been in the RCMP detachment every week since Deneen's murder two and a half months ago. He'd been right under their noses the whole time. So, so this is a man who is already convicted of stuff. The police are watching him and he still went and did heinous crimes. It looks like he did. Oh, yeah, well, I'm going with my belief here. Okay. Your belief to this point. Yeah, it's always right. We'll take a break right here. And we're back. On January 1st, 1985, police brought Terrence Burlingham in for questioning, but only in the Brenda Hughes murder. They held their questions about Deneen Worms for later mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. Initially, Burlingham denied any knowledge of Brenda Hughes' murder and claimed he was home with his dad at the time. He also described himself wearing different clothing than Harry Walker had seen. Hmm. Burlingham was caught in lie after lie. Yeah. His alibi fell apart when his father stated he hadn't seen Terrence on the morning of the killing. So his own dad is like, no, I didn't see him. <laughs> Investigating officers hit him hard with that, along with the facts that they knew what he'd been wearing thanks to the eyewitness. Confronted with this evidence, Terrence began to talk. According to court documents, Burlingham gave an eight-page statement about the killing of Brenda Hughes, mm. but stopped short of admitting rape, Ugh. denying having intercourse with her at all. He said he woke up that Sunday morning planning to break into another house. When he got there, he noticed the people were home, so he went to another residence. 
and that just happened to be the Hughes residence. Yeah, so it was yeah. all by chance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What a quick. You know, it's funny. Uh, I, I've heard a lot firsthand and whatnot from people who work in the parole field. There, amongst criminals, you know, there's parts where they're like they're okay with admitting that they murdered somebody, but things like mutilation and rape, or, or and rape, or some sexually deviant behavior. That's when they say no, no, but that no, no. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember a friend of mine who who was a parole officer mm -hmm. confronting. One of these individuals saying, like, we've talked about. Yeah, exactly. It was saying, like, I don't understand it. So morally, you're okay with having killed that person. You're okay with having killed that person. But mutilation, no, no. That's where you draw the line? Mm -hmm. Like, it's just so it bizarre how, how the, the, the mind works with these individuals. Part of Burlingham's statement goes this way, quote, question, did you know it was the Hughes residence? Answer. No, I didn't even know her. Um, I uh, knocked on the door. No one answered. So I went in. And when I got upstairs, a girl came out of the bedroom bare naked. Question. Which bedroom was that, Terry? Answer. The one off to the side. I don't know. She asked me what I wanted. And all of a sudden we were together scrapping. So I took the gun out, hit her in the head. She got knocked out. I drug her downstairs. I laid her on the couch in the rumpus room. I put the pillow over her head, put the shotgun on the pillow, and pulled the trigger. So I ran, run back upstairs, got in the bedroom, the mom and dad's room, I guess. I found a silver box in the closet floor. Then I went and looked in the other bedroom. There was a wallet, end quote. So I have some interesting mm -hmm. flags about mm -hmm. this particular. Do you, did you know it was the Hughes residence? No, I didn't even know her. Her, not them. Right. Her. Her, yep. specifically. Yep, no, that stood out, yeah. Mm-hmm. So I personally think he was watching her. I, I absolutely... He had his eye on her. Uh, maybe for a few days, maybe longer, but he knew when they left. That was such a narrow time period. Right. An hour and a half to two hours, they're yep, gone. They're gone to church. You, you, don't, you don't have a long period of time. So it makes me think he's actually probably been watching longer because he knows they're... Sunday routine mm. and knows that he only has a short period of time. Well, he is a B&E artist too, so he knows exactly what time of day to go into people's houses. Yeah, yeah. But I, I fully agree with you. I think he knew exactly in which home he was breaking into and who was there. When he was asked where he'd gotten the gun, Terrence claimed that he'd stolen it from a house the previous Sunday. <laughs> Police noted that if this was true, the weapon would have been with Terrence only after Deneen was murdered. They had to find out whose it was or was there a second gun. Yeah, yeah. When Burlingham was asked why he needed a gun if he was just breaking into houses, he said, I don't know, I just grabbed it in the morning. I was going to rob Mac's store. That's so convenient. Right. Yeah, wow. So, I'm just, well, I decided I, I was going to break into houses, but then he didn't mention robbing Mac's store before. No. No, he's coming up with this as he goes. Sure. Yeah. There were many inconsistencies between Burlingham's statement and the actual evidence. There were no injuries present on Brenda's body, which would have indicated her being dragged downstairs unconscious. Mm -hmm. There would have been carpet burns and abrasions. Well, and he also said that they were thrown down. Well, in the, in the hallway. Yeah. But he said he conked her and knocked her out. But yeah, he said initially there was a scrap. I think was was exactly what yeah. we said. And so, you know. It just sounds like he, he took control of the situation with yeah. the shotgun. Well, that's the thing. Like, if you have a shotgun and so you, somebody, you confront somebody and they're like, ah, what are you doing here? You're going to put the shotgun down and bat? No, you're just going to pick up the shotgun and go, don't move. Yeah. And I think because the bed was disheveled. Oh, yes, he, clearly. He raped her on the bed yeah. and then took her downstairs where he, he probably did that again and then shot her. Oh, my God. That, yeah. <clears throat> also, Brenda's head didn't show evidence of any traumatic injury that would have rend rendered her unconscious. Mm -hmm, yeah. This could have possibly been in the same region as the gunshot wounds, but Brenda's skull in that area was destroyed by the blast. So oh. it's it would have been impossible to determine that 100%. Yeah. yeah. There was other physical evidence that contradicted Burlingham's accounts of the killing. Fibers matching those of Brenda's sweater were found on the pants that Terrence had been wearing. Hmm. 
Fibers matching those belonging to the blue bedspread on Daryl Hughes' bed were also found on Burlingham's pants. So uh, he said she was, she was naked. So wrong. Wrong. Uh, he said that they didn't go. He didn't go in that room until he went to go and get the money. Right. Which I'm sure he didn't roll around on the bed. No. Wrong. Yeah. Also on the blue bedspread, there were human hairs consistent with that of Brenda Hughes' head and pubic hair. And of course, there was the semen that matched Terence's blood type. DNA evidence was not yet a thing, no. but this was still significant. Yeah. At about 3.24 p.m. during the interrogation, Terence asked to speak with a lawyer. He spoke with his lawyer on the telephone, and after the call, Burlingham told investigators that his lawyer had told him not to say anything else. So he's already admitted. Yeah, like, <laughs> he's already ri written an eight-page statement where he's admitted to killing... Yeah, uh, sorry, sorry, Terrence, the cat's out of the bag. Right, in this case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Police pressed on, though, and Terrence relented against the advice his lawyer had given him, and he oh, decided that he would give them even more information. Which, good. I mean, and this is where, like, I would struggle as an officer because I would so desperately just be wanting to go, like, hey, look, dipshit. Yeah. Here's these, so how the hell did that semen get on there then? Somebody just break in at, like. Oh. Yeah. From court documents, quote, later that afternoon, however, Terrence Burlingham took the police to his parents' home where incriminating evidence was located, including a 410 shotgun, which he claimed had been used to kill Brenda Hughes. He also took the police to the Hughes residence where he showed the police how he had killed Brenda. That reenactment was videotaped. Oh, geez. End quote. Oh, gee, gee, gee. After the interrogation... RCMP noticed that Terrence Burlingham was in a good mood. He even asked for and received a dinner from McDonald's and thanked them very much afterward. They had him on the murder of Brenda Hughes, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. And they could hold him until they were ready to talk to him about, about Deanne Worms. Yeah, because they haven't even brought it up at this point, right? No, They're this, just focusing they, on the, yeah. Yeah. There was no hard evidence linking him to that crime other than the similarities of the two. Maybe it's the gun. Mm -hmm. A man named Ivan Legranger had reported a double barrel 410 rifle stolen from his residence in January of mm -hmm. 1984. So this is even many months. Many months before. He came in and identified the rifle as his, even though the barrels and stock had been sawed off with a hacksaw, making the firearm ineffective for its intended purpose, small game hunting. It was now only useful at extremely close range mm. for nefarious purposes. Yep. This could very well be the same weapon used to kill Deneen once again. Terrence was caught in another lie. Oh. Hopefully the gun would match, or better yet, Burlingham would talk even more. On January 4th, 1985, the day of Brenda Lee Hughes' funeral at a Cranbrook church, Terrence Wayne Burlingham was on the hot seat once again. This time, RCMP investigators came at him about the murder of Deanne Worms just three months prior. Hmm. Terrence wasn't talking. He denied any knowledge of Deneen Worms' murder. From this point on, the case gets kind of complicated. Okay. From court documents, quote, From January 1st to January 4th, 1985, the police subjected Burlingham to an intensive and often manipulative interrogation. They systematically questioned him in spite of the fact that he repeatedly stated he would not speak unless he could consult with his lawyer. Mm. The police urged the accused to tell them what he knew about the crime, suggesting that any delay would hurt his parents, since just as they would be getting over the shock of the Hughes murder, they would be doubly hurt by a second murder charge. Yep. Okay. One officer said, quote, I don't think you're being very fair to your parents. Um, they, you know, they love you very much. And from what I see, you're a loving and caring sort of person. And, uh, you know, you have the right to weigh the uh, advice that you're getting. But I can see that by delaying, you're just hurting them. Basically, what you're saying is you're going to put your parents through this for a long, uh, a lot longer. From what I've seen... I thought you had a lot more love for them than that, Terry. Mm. I'm curious to see how he responds. Terrence responded, from what I've just seen, you're trying to use my parents against me. Mm, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, you, well, exactly. I mean, it, no, probably not an, 
I'm not even probably, it's not an inaccurate statement that the officers are making, mm -hmm. but for sure they're leveraging his emotions. Yeah. Even though he's continually saying, I don't want to talk to you. I want to talk to my lawyer. Oh, well that part, like, yeah, the fact that he's saying, I don't want to talk. I want to talk to my lawyer. And they continue to question. You're just opening your, your, the case up to, uh, appeal after appeal after appeal. Well, it gets better, Scott. Oh, thank God. Again, from quote, again, from court documents, quote on January and by better, I mean worse. Damn you. <laughs> On January 4th, 1985, police offered Terrence a, quote, deal. Oh, shit. They claimed they had instructions from their boss and Crown Counsel to make such a deal. Burlingham was told by the police that he would only be charged with second-degree murder of Worms in exchange for his providing to the police the location of the gun and other ancillary information related to the murder. That's right. They discovered that the gun used in the Brenda Hughes murder had not been the one that had been used in the Deneen Worms murder. Okay. When Terrence refused to accept the deal without consulting his lawyer, the officers continued to express doubts regarding the helpfulness of Burlingham's defense counsel, emphasizing that he was taking the weekend off. They kept the deal open only for the weekend, the period of time during mm. which Terrence's counsel was unavailable underscoring all the while that the deal was but a one-time chance, end quote. I mean, creative, sure. Uh, smart, no. I don't think it's legal. Uh, legal, also negatory. Cops led Terrence Burlingham to believe that his lawyer wouldn't be able to negotiate anything better for him. This is the stuff, like, so we talk a lot about how much we respect and cherish and... Uh, think greatly of of uh, officers. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean there aren't going to be people who make some mistakes. Pretty shitty examples, and this is well. I don't think I don't think it's an intentionally shitty thing. No, I, I don't I think, think they're just after a, a certain goal, and it's like we talked about last week. They're just looking for confirmation that they're right. I, I absolutely agree, but the result of that is you could let a killer go. Right. And and so I don't have a lot of wiggle room for just, well, you know, like I, I think they were trying to do the right thing. This is your job. Terrence called another lawyer who also advised him not to speak to the police any further. <laughs> However, by midnight that evening, after cops had told him multiple times no lawyer could do any better for him, Terrence gave in. He'd take the deal. <laughs> he confessed to the murder of Deneen Worms. He'd used another 410, stolen from a residence four days prior to Deneen's murder. Terrence asked the officers to drive him to the Fort Steel Bridge over the Kootenai River. That's where he'd thrown the gun, and he pointed to the area where he'd tossed it in. RCMP divers found it right where Terrence claimed it would be only a day later. Also that night, Terrence toured the murder site at the gravel pit with investigators pointing out where Deneen had been shot and where he'd left her. On the morning of January 5th, 1985, Terrence Burlingham told his girlfriend, Judy Hall, that he'd shown police where the gun was and that he knew something about Deneen's death. Police pulled back on the deal, admitting they'd made a mistake and they were unauthorized to make any kind of deal with it like this. Hmm. As far as I understand, any deal, and I'm talking about personally, uh, any deal must involve the defense counsel that an accused person has acquired and also must involve Crown Counsel. I don't think the cops can make that kind of deal on their own at all. I don't think so. Regardless of what Burlingham was promised, he was charged with first-degree murder of Deneen Worms as well as the first-degree murder of Brenda Hughes. Both charges would be tried separately. Terrence, of course, pled not guilty to both, mm. even though he did admit it to both, mm -hmm. <laughs> to the police. But I guess, you know, the, you get with the lawyers and they say, we think we can get you off. Yeah. yeah. Let's give it a shot. Terrence's trial for the murder of Brenda Hughes was to be first okay. in September 1985. The physical evidence in the first trial was overwhelming, as was the tape of him confessing to Brenda's murder, albeit leaving out some key details, including the sexual assault, later filled in by other witnesses for the Crown. 
The Hughes family had to endure watching the reenactment of their daughter's murder in their own home, videotaped by police, with Burlingham as the star. Oh, I can't imagine that. A six-man, five-woman jury found Terrence Wayne Burlingham guilty of first-degree murder of 16-year-old Brenda Lee Hughes as spectators in the courtroom cheered. Burlingham was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole for 25 years, According to news reports, Ray Hughes, Brenda's dad, clearly angry, said that Burlingham hadn't gotten what he deserved and that, quote, he should be tortured the same way my daughter was. Yeah, I, I as a father, I, I could agree with that want. Burlingham was shipped off to Ocala for assessment and the first part of his incarceration as a murderer. The Dedean Worms trial took place in September of 1986. In this trial, the tape of Burlingham's confession was played. Forensic experts were struck by the similarities in the two killings. Mm -hmm. So they played the confessions from the first murder trial, including, you know. Judy Hall, who'd been dating Terrence Burlingham for months, was called to testify. She had met with Terrence Burlingham and Everett Biddlecombe, a.k.a. Rabbit, at Duffy's on the night of Deneen's murder. Biddlecombe and Burlingham claimed they'd been smoking weed, were drunk, and had taken LSD. All three had been present for the wet t-shirt contest that Deneen and her friend had participated in that night. According to an article in the Alberta Valley Times from September 25, 1986, Judy, Rabbit, and Terence Burlingham left the club together. Biddlecombe was dropped off at his home first by Burlingham, and Judy and Burlingham went on to party further. Judy lost track of Terrence when she was taken to the RCMP lockup after a drunken argument with her brother about her girlfriend. Okay. The next day, after she was released from the lockup, she went over to Terry's place. She spotted an orange and red quilted vest with a floral pattern on a table in his house. Okay. She asked if she could have it, and Terrence angrily grabbed it back from her. She didn't know what had become of it. The Crown claimed later it matched the one missing from the Deneen Worms homicide scene. (sighs) Jesus, okay. Judy testified that Burlingham was now saying Rabbit had committed Deneen's murder. From court documents, quote, He said he was there, but he didn't do it. And I asked him, tell me about it. And he said that when he left my place that night, that he picked up, I'm not sure if he said Rabbit and Deneen or Rabbit then Deneen, and he said he picked them up walking down 2nd Street and Rabbit grabbed Deneen and threw her in the car. And they, Rabbit directed him where to go. These are her words, so that's why it's kind of disjointed. Yeah, yeah. Told him to go up Gold Creek Road, so he drove up there. And when they got to this place, Rabbit opened the glove compartment and pushed the trunk button to open the trunk. And he got out and grabbed a gun out of the car and pulled Deneen out of the car and forced her to take her clothes off. Then he said that he beat her up and dragged her off into the bushes and he shot her, end quote. Sure, I'm quite skeptical. Again, there was no evidence that she'd been beaten yep. at all. Yep. Um, which is interesting. The sweater ended up at his place. Yep. Some poetry was found in, t- in a notebook in Terrence's handwriting. It was chilling. In part, it went, quote, Here's one last clue that you shall be given. Whoever I take... They will all be women. One of my ladies I'm going to set free to tell you the story all about me. The rest, like the rest, she shall be killed because her use has been fulfilled. Blood is red. You pigs are blue. Start counting victims. There will be a few. Grass is green. The branches are dead. If you ever find her, she'll surely be dead. Holy shit. End quote. Jesus. Not surprisingly, though, the poem was not Burlingham's own words. It had been copied from a crime novel by Ralph Glendening called The Ultimate Game. So he was a plagiarizer as well. (laughs) (laughs) Oh. Those damn plagiarists. Oh, refraining from making a joke. Yeah, me too. We just did. Although it took the jury a little longer in this case because most of the evidence was circumstantial, they came back with a verdict of guilty for the first-degree murder of Deneen Worms. This earned Burlingham another life 25 sentence and made him a two-time first-degree murderer. Yeah. 
In an October 9, 1986 article in the Alberni Valley Times, editor Rob Diot wrote that Burlingham had been laughing and leering at April and Raymond Worms every time the, the jury was not in the courtroom. They were glad the trial was over, but were out of pocket to attend the trial in Surrey, away from the Port Alberni home. But oh, nobody seemed to care about that. What a disgusting son of a bitch. Yeah, just like... Oh, Give them the eyeball. You, you've killed their daughter. And, and now, now you're trying to intimidate them and stare them down. Yep. Oh. It wasn't over, though. After multiple failed appeals, in 1995, Terrence Wayne Burlingham's appeal, based on improper conduct by police in his interrogation for the murder of Deneen Worms, was upheld. Mm, yeah. His conviction was vacated in that case. Yeah, I saw that coming. The evidence from Burlingham's January 4th confession was to be thrown out. The deal that never emerged was at issue, and all the evidence, including the murder weapon itself, were to be thrown out as Burlingham's attorney had n not been involved when he should have been. Yeah, yeah. Terrence's charter rights had been trampled on. Like it or not, a new trial was ordered. Yeah, and I'm imagining... All that evidence doesn't exist. Yeah, because they threw it out. It was thrown out. Yeah, well, so I'm, that's what I'm saying. So like a new trial, but they're not going to have anything. Well, guess what? What? RCMP went back to gathering evidence that had not been poisoned by the overeager officers. Some of Judy Hall's testimony was still good. She mentioned that he had told her he told police where the gun could be found. Okay. He told her he knew something about Deneen's murder. Mm -hmm. And this is also when Robert D. Keppel's expertise, in particular in signature murder, was called in. So this is why he wrote the chapter in his book, Serial Violence. From Keppel's book, Serial Violence, quote, Rape murderers are driven by their anger, power, or both. They need to express their emotions through control over their victims. After studying the case files of thousands of killers and interviewing many violent offenders, such as the one in these cases, the author concluded that most signature killers know they are committing a crime, but that knowledge is secondary in importance to the sexual excitement of terrorizing their victims. The key to the signature in these cases was the manner in which the offender accomplished immediate and sustained domination over and terror to the victims, end quote. To me, that's the uh, ultimate fear in regards to uh, murder, because it's not like this person, my job is just to eradicate you, or I get the play. Like, it's not just a toggle switch flipped and you're done. No, it's they, where, horrifying. Their intent and what they want is your pain. Yes. For as long as possible. Sexually sadistic. Yeah, that that's their objective, and that is just terrifying. Keppel went on to show four points that proved this was a highly personalized signature. Mm -hmm. In other words, both crimes had to have been committed by the same hand. Hmm. We shortened the points Keppel made below to quickly summarize his findings in the chapter on this case uh, in his book, Serial Violence. Quote, one, in both cases, the offender demonstrated pre-planning and vast experience by his actions. Carrying any version of a sawed-off 410 shotgun is highly intimidating and terror-producing. Mm -hmm. This weapon was pre-selected and brought to the scene of each murder. The use of a 410 shotgun to intimidate his victims was one element of this killer's signature. Second, it was necessary for the killer to leave both victims nude in sexually degrading positions. Mm -hmm. The intent of the killer was to present these victims as disposable, serving no value, and as tools of ridicule, leaving both bodies in positions that the finder would believe was sexually degrading and also demonstrating to the finder that the victims were extremely vulnerable was a signature of this killer. Yeah, disgusting. Three, the absence of damage to each victim's body is vital evidence of this killer's signature. 
In each case, there was no evidence of struggle, binding, strangulation, physical torture, or post-mortem mutilation. When one considers rape murders in general, to find no additional marks other than the death-producing injuries is exceptionally rare. Yeah, that's a really good point that hadn't stood out to me so far. Well, the title of the chapter is actually, Look for What's Not There. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and four... The placement and number of gunshots to each victim's head is a signature element of this killer. The killer chose, felt he had, to fire a second shot, although the first shot had proved fatal in both cases. In addition, the near contact and coup de gras type wounds to the left side of each victim's head indicate this killer's need to ensure that the victims were indeed dead. The additional shot reflects force beyond what was necessary to commit the murder. Mm -hmm. It's like another insult. Yeah. In yeah. Quote. Whew, I need a cigarette. Yeah, that was intense, right? Jesus. As it was now the 90s, Deneen's family hoped for a DNA match on the semen in both cases. And guess what? Uh, both indicated the same perpetrator, Terrence Wayne Burlingham. Well, that's some solid evidence. Right there. Yep. You, you know, you can... Be, you can you cannot have the shotgun. Rather than put the family's and the government's wallet through another trial, Burlingham was offered a sweeter deal than he'd initially hoped for. Burlingham pleaded guilty to and was convicted of manslaughter in Deneen Worm's murder due to overwhelming physical, new physical evidence. And this brings us to today. This is why this guy is getting out into the community. Because, you know, like he got life 25. If he had gotten two life 25 sentences, we wouldn't be seeing this guy out. But because he got manslaughter in one, he's not a double murderer. Right. So I'm assuming that they went, they offered the plea or went with the plea because even though they had the DNA... They were still unsure of... Well, they didn't... It, a trial is expensive. I, I get that, but so were people's maybe they, lives. Maybe they were... Because they didn't have the murder weapon anymore. Well, I, I'm thinking that has to be a component, because if they were absolutely confident yeah. in their case... Well, they're absolutely confident in a few of the uh, Willie Picton or Robert Picton murders as well, but haven't tried those either. Because they... The that cost element is well. He's in jail. He's not getting out. We don't have to worry about that. Whereas this one, uh, no, he clearly. Well, who knows what was in their heads? And you know, and I, as much as I, I was ragging on the officers for botching that uh, confession out of him. In the same, I can also like I can imagine how shitty they must feel. Oh, totally. I mean, imagine being them, and you're like, oh my god. My eagerness to try to wrap this up and get a guilty man uh, found guilty is actually backfiring and more people could get like, I'm sure the, the weight of guilt on them is immense. Oh, sure. By the time this podcast drops and you're listening to it on September 16th, 2019, Terrence Wayne Burlingham will have been out twice on escorted temporary absences for, quote, personal development purposes. In the community of Abbotsford, from the Mission Minimum Security Institution he's currently being housed in. Oh, my God. He's scheduled for two more visits to our community on September 19th and the 26th. Oh, my God. The, this comes even after the parole board refused him parole last year, saying he was, quote, a high risk to reoffend. And, according to an article on the abbeynews.com site, quote, Burlingham attacked a caseworker while in prison several years ago after feeling sexual urges. And so turned the rusty wheels of Canadian justice. So I'm going to try to give the benefit of the doubt and assume that these personal development days are something extremely important and something heavily guarded. Because if they're so, saying no okay, to Scott, parole... Guess what? What? He is not being heavily guarded. 
the gu- the person who is looking after him will either be an unarmed prison officer who will be within line of sight of him at all time or even possibly a volunteer from the community i but i know people who work in these roles and i know they're not the kind of people who would like be like eh, it'll be fine like they take this shit serious i have to have faith that they know what they're doing but holy shit does it scare the hell out of me <laughs> My God, this is like, for those of who don't know geography where we live, it's like next door. Yeah. Sweet yep. Jesus. Yep. Oh, but wait, Scott, there's more. That never ends well. No. Nope. Never. Uh, from an article on the Victoria News, VicNews.com website, quote, officials noted that Burlingham did accept some responsibility as sober, has lived in at a minimum security institution since 2016, has engaged in counseling, and has been on chemical castration meds. Uh, Oh, oh, it's the first time I've heard about something like that happening. So I don't know if those actually work. I've heard they actually do not work. uh, (sighs) Chemical castration meds. Oh, I I don't know how I feel about that and, and, and how it would relate to him murdering again. Right. So, guess what? Oh, please tell. This hasn't been Burlingham's first time out of jail that this what? other decision reveals. Yeah. Uh, he, uh, the the decision where he was turned down for uh, his application for parole, yes. noted that he's worked, quote, outside of the institution without incident since 2010. Ooh. So, I don't know if he's working full-time Outside of the institution. And has been, has been constantly since then. Yeah. Or, or did that just mean like he once went out for a weekend to right. mow some grass? Holy jeez. And like their own words again. Yeah. I did accept some, some responsibility. responsibility. Some. Some. Oh, that's good enough. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of feel bad. Oh, yep, yeah, good. Here's your day pass. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Such is life, right? Mm. I hope, hope not. <laughs> Don't want it to be. And that's it for this week's story. Oh, thanks. You're welcome. Wow. I'm just going to skip away. But I thought, uh, let's cover something that's in the news. Let's Topical. Let's co- cover yeah, something yeah, rele- relevant yeah. because people know what he did and it's being talked about again, but people don't know all the details. So guess what? Here you go. Again, I have to put some faith and trust in the people making these decisions. Yeah. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. I'm a little PO'd. All right. Um, oh, my gosh. Guess what time it is. It's time for... Uh, anger and no, rage. Be, no, it's nice, and... it's nice things. Oh, okay. It's time to say thank you to people. Oh, thank God. Right? Oh, thank God. I know. Before we get into our Patreon shout-outs, uh, we have a contest to complete. That's right. I'm looking forward to finding out who the winner is. So let's find out which of our two listeners have won a signed copy of Eve Lazarus' book, Murder by Milkshake, an astonishing story of adultery, arsenic, and a charismatic killer. I was going to say, it's one hell of a story. We've covered it, and it, it, what, a, what a wacky story. It's a great book. Yeah, it's the story of a radio personality, Rene Castellani, who murdered his wife via arsenic and vanilla milkshakes from a local white spot restaurant. Yep. So our winners are, and I put 330 names into this randomizer. Uh... First up, <gasps> Alicia Cardoza from Ventura, California. Oh, sweet. You're a winner. Alicia. Hooray. And she's a yumber yarder too, so she's yes, pretty stoked. I recognize the name. And next, <laughs> Tony King Rose from Vancouver, British Columbia. Not only a wicked name, you're local. You'll get local. your book quick. So congrats to our listeners who, uh, both Alicia and Tony King Rose, uh, Alicia Cordoza and Tony King Rose, who have won the books. Woo. We'll send them out to you this week. And um, if you want to learn more about Eve Lazarus, go to Eve lazarus.com and i'll put that in the show notes yeah yeah she's a wicked person great books 
awesome possums. Congratulations, y'all. I really am so grateful that we have anybody who bothers to listen to this show, number one. Yeah. But number two, how about them patrons who are taking care of us every month? It's ridiculous, the love that we get. Oh, just mind-boggling. It really is. It really is. <laughs> that us two, and- us two goofs have people that love us enough. To send us a buck or two, or even 25 some yeah. 50 and $75. Yeah, it's really, like, it's humbling. It really is. It, you know, like, it's just two dorks <laughs> getting together every week. Well, I do actually work really hard prior to our getting together, but... Well, so I'm, I have a job. Yeah. Well, so I'm working hard. I kind of don't. <laughs> but it's, like... Other than this. But, like, two years ago, this wasn't something... Where we're at wasn't something that could have been predicted. No, we were or, just... Or we were only just talking about it. Then. Yeah. Like, it wasn't something expected. I couldn't... If you had said, I bet you from two years... In two years from now, we're going to have amazing, large listener base supporting... Like, I'd be, like sure, our moms and dads, like... Yeah, that's what I thought was going to happen. Yeah. It's, so it's really, it's really humbling and amazing. Well, let's get to it. Let's thank these patrons. Let's do it. So first up we have from Bismarck, North Dakota, a place where oh. I have actually been. Whoa. I drove through there. On your way to uh, um, Toronto? Driving across the country yeah. last year. Yeah. yeah, I remember. I remember. I stayed in Bismarck. It was nice. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah? And her name is Carrie Lippert. Oh, hi, Carrie. Thanks so much, Carrie. Did you have... Uh... She'll be able to listen to the after show. Oh, sweet. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 It's where... We apologize. Yeah. (laughs) Top shelf content there. Exactly. Top shelf. (laughs) And next up, we have Caitlin Payne, and she's from Covington, Kentucky. Oh, sweet. Hey, thanks, Caitlin. Uh, Next, we have Megan Hopf. Megan? Yes. Oh, interesting pronunciation. Yeah, yeah. It could be Megan, but it's... It's spelled Megan. 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 Hello, Magan. What is los, Magan? Whoa. Where is she from? Is she German? Because that hoof sort of sounds like... No, it does, doesn't it? It sounds like when I, the sound I make when I get punched in the stomach. <laughs> also that... Hoof. No, she's Irish. That's not an Irish name. Brown with an E is an Irish name. So she couldn't have immigrated there? Okay. Well, huh? Fair enough. Yeah, yeah exactly. Okay. exactly. I thought you meant ethnically Irish. No, that's where she's. That's where she lives. Because I am fifty percent ethnically Irish. Are you? Yeah, I gotta do mine one day. You do it. Yeah, we're I'd... probably brothers. <laughs> oh, Jesus, that would explain a lot. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so she's from Ireland. What yep. does she do in Ireland? A potato peeler. Oh, yeah. Wow, that's really. Uh, what? That's kind of racist. Well, why don't you ask her why she chose that job? I don't know. You no, know, Mike. I mean, come on. Thanks, Megan. Thanks, Megan. <laughs> Keep on peeling. Deborah Davis from Yellowknife Northwest Territories. I, really, I think this is our first Northwest Territories person. I have a real hankering to go visit the Northwest Territories. I want someday. to go to take Carol to see the Northern Lights because she never has seen them. Uh, really? I, don't, I don't know how. She lived in Calgary. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, she's lived here. Yeah. I don't know how she's never looked up into the sky and not seen them, but she has not. The best I I was I stayed in Drumheller in Alberta. We camped there. Oh, Drum, yeah, yeah. Oh, the uh, Aurora Borealis was amazing. Next up, we have Jessica Roberge. Oh, where is Jessica Roberge from? Paris, Paris, France. Yeah, Paris. Yeah. Does she is she a, a tour guide in the catacombs? So who's now who's being like all racist? Like? How's that racist? That would be a cool job. No, it's not what she does. What does she do? She makes baguettes. Stop. <laughs> uh, n- thank you, Jessica. Thanks, Jessica. Uh, Natalia Galan. Yeah. Where's Natalia from? Oh. That sounds Italian. It does, doesn't it? Natalia Galan. Hey. I'm a Natalia. I'm a Roberto Luongo. I'm making the pasta. I'm a Natalia. I stop with the puck. Hey, I, I'm making the baguettes. So what does where? So where is Natalia from? Oh, uh, oh God, uh, Russia. I was gonna say New. I was gonna say uh, Newfoundland, but New Zealand. She's from New Zealand. New Zealand and the Boomerang Fish Act yeah. from the Muppet Show. Yes, that's yeah. That's that's, that's she, what she does. She, that was her on the show. 
this is New Zealand and my boomerang fish act. That that's ex- okay. Oh. See, I don't know how she'll feel about your impression of her, but uh, yeah. Well, we apologize, Natalia. Yeah, yeah maybe not. Kylie Ryan. Hey, Kylie. Thank and you. she is from Jade City. British Columbia. Where the deuce is that? I actually don't know. I've never heard of Jade City. Should we look up Jade City while we're Did she get the name her own? Because that's, like, a, it's that's like, a cool name for a... Like she just found a spot in the woods and like, here we go, Jade City. It sounds Ooh, like something from the interior. Oh, it has to be. So, okay, here we go. Close to Cassiar. Interesting. Jade City. Close to Castle. So I'm imagining whoa. it's got to be named after. Holy crap! What is that? She's about? really way up there. Oh, wow, it's closer to the. Uh, well, yeah, it's above Dee's Lake. Yeah. Not Dee's. Mm-hmm. Now. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's uh, Dee's yeah, Lake. Wow. It's almost like at the Yukon border. Yeah. There. Yeah. It's seriously. So you're way up there. How big is it? Uh, let's see. Jade City. How big is Jade City? Uh, it doesn't look very big. It looks like a pin on the map that I'm looking at. Uh, yeah, I don't know. You could just type population. Just, just, well, night is my draw. It's very small. That's it, that building that you found. That was it. It's pretty much just that building. It's the spasm of northern. The sp- <laughs> and spasm is, is an actual place in British Columbia. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, every single time we drove, pa- we would drive past and my dad would make, oh, don't blink, you'll miss spasm. you miss spasm. That's ridiculous. Yeah, I will um, use that. For well, time. thank you, Kylie. Uh, maybe when we're driving up through uh, to the Yukon for Carol and go- going over to those Northwest Territories, we can stop in in Jade City. I really now have a hankering to go to Jade City. I bet you I, she can. I bet you she sees the Northern Lights up oh there. Oh my God, she's probably like sick of them. Like turn them down. <laughs> turn I'm trying to sleep. Oh my! But I bet you, like, geez, it's got to be named after. Mining back in the day, maybe there was sure, jade, in jade specific. Surprise. Yeah, I yeah. know, right? Yeah. Wow, you're you're a rocket scientist. Diamond City over here. Katie Clev zero eight. Mm-hmm. That's an interesting. That's name. <laughs> legal. That's her legal name. Clevoit. No, I think it's actually if now yeah, it may be something else that is clever. Ah, do you think she's clever? I think so. Where is she from? Uh, oh, the Ukraine. Oh. Yeah. It's not the Ukraine. I've been corrected on that. Oh, have you? Because the old Russian, the so in Soviet days, they yeah. called it the Ukraine. Yeah. It was part of Soviet Russia. Now it's just Ukraine. Oh, well, no, see, okay, that's where I should correct you. Because, uh, no, that's like, the, that's like the city is called the Ukraine. It's actually... Oh, uh, it's a different place. Yeah. Oh, so it's not actually Ukraine. Oh, no. It's the Ukraine. Eastern That's the name of the city. The Ukraine. Where? Pittsburgh. Oh. Yeah. Pennsylvania, really. I mean. Okay. So it's sort of a Pittsburgh it's like, suburb. It's like I was going to say. It's a suburb of Pittsburgh. Yeah. The Ukraine. Sidney Crosby. Good Nova Scotian kid. He probably, probably lives in the Ukraine. You should move there. Mm-hmm. Chelsea Watts. She's from Warman, Saskatchewan. Oh, sweet. I've never heard of that place either. Well, this is like quite the geography. War man. War man. Whoa, man. That's war man. It's war man. Hey, Chelsea. Thank you, Chelsea. Thanks, thank Chelsea. You, thank you. Thank you. Enjoy, enjoy those uh, uh, after shows. And Jessica Hamilton from Dorval, Quebec. Quebecois? Well, Hamilton is typically an English name, so she would be a Quebecer. Not Quebecer. A She'd be a Quebecer, not a Quebecois. Hmm. Mais pourquoi? Hey, look at that. Uh, Mais oui. Donnez-moi le fromage, s'il vous plaît. Oh, you, you don't want me to say the few words I know. Avec le pantalon? Because the few words I know are not good. No, I'm just thinking of what, now you put all the dirty words that I learned in French class mm-hmm. in my brain. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's the ones I know. Allons-y. We will leave. Say de la merde. Yeah. And Daniela Walker. Where's Daniela from? I, uh, I don't know. Why don't we ask her? Okay, Daniela. Yes. Oh, Daniela's here with us. Hey, guys. Love the show. Why Spend is... More, more so, Scott. He's, he's dreamy. Oh, God. 
I'm 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 good with being the smart one. And boy, are you! I don't know about that either. <laughs> if you're the smart one. Oh boy, we're in so trouble. So if you were wondering where I'm from, where is she from? Where are you from? I'm sorry. Port Port Hope. Ontario. Yes. Oh, that's where my friend Melissa lives. Oh, Melissa. Green? McDonald. McDonald. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, she's very, very kind. She is actually. She's very, very nice. Yeah. I she, went to high school with her. She's a great teacher. She's not a teacher. Uh, I mean, she che- may teach. Cellist. Cellist. She's a great cellist. Sure. This is frustrating me now. What is? <laughs> wow, her voice got very deep. No, she left. She said what she needed to see, oh, and she okay, left. There you go. Yeah. No, no, she you didn't hear the door close? <laughs> I guess I did. Oh, okay, well, there you go. Yeah. We did get some donut money this week again. Oh, sweet. Um, I don't know what's wrong with Monet Terrio. Maybe she set up like a, a, a purchase, PayPal purchase for every couple of weeks because there's more. What is happening? From Monet, thank you I mean, so keep much. A, keep it coming, but I mean, wow, thank you. You are amazing. It's like weekly. A weekly, like, well, it seems like weekly. And also, Monet is is a patron as well, so. Yeah. You just enjoy everything we have to uh, offer now. She loves our donut money. You, you can come crash at our place. Uh, here's one from Mariam de Cormier. Oh, I love, God, I love that name. De Cormier. Yeah, I went to school mm. with some girls la- with the last name Cormier. De Cormier. Yeah. Just, uh, sounds regal. And she says, just a little something for your hard work. This might give you a very small poutine or like eight Timbits, eight Timbits. Ha ha. Love your podcast. Salutations from Montreal. Montreal. And the Montreal Canadian, eh? I also want Guy to. Lefleur, I am smoking in the penalty box. <laughs> <laughs> I also really want to go to Montreal someday. Pretty much like everywhere I'm, that we mention, I'm like, I want to go there. I drove past Montreal. Yeah. I went to Quebec City, but I didn't go to Montreal because uh, I just didn't have time. I re- if I go to Montreal, I want to go there as a proper vacation. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think it's one of those places you need to spend yeah. some time. My buddy Nick lives there, so hi, Nick. Hey, in Nick. Montreal. Hey. hey, Montreal, Nick. Hi, Montreal, Nick. And finally, we got some donut money from Chusho Kigio. Wow. Thank Chusho you. Chusho Kigio. Thank it you. sounds ja- Japanese. Yeah. Uh Chusho Kigyo. Yeah, it does. It does. Well, that's a pretty awesome name. Uh, you? Yes. And uh, you know, they're probably from Africa right now, and they're like, you son of a bitch. So some some Japanese kids uh, that Carol used to teach, they used to they used to try to get me to speak with oh. a Japanese accent. So okay. I'm not being racist by saying it, but because they would say, "Do you talk from just like old man?" <laughs> And then they told me, you look like a Bruce Willis. <laughs> and I was bald at the time, so maybe uh, a little bit, but you look like a Bruce Willis. <laughs> but that's exactly how they said it. Sounds very endearing. And I told you about the song that they had to sing at the end of their English. Oh, I, yes, I don't remember. It's Jelly on a Plate, Jelly on a Plate, Wiggle Waggle, Wiggle Waggle, Jelly on a Plate. <laughs> Now picture somebody with a Japanese accent yeah. singing Jelly on a Plate, and you'll laugh all day. I don't know like, why those words, because it's hard to... Pr- it's, to it's very hard, hard for a Japanese and, person to enunciate. Wow. But it it helps them to practice. Some of them would get it, mm-hmm. but others would just laugh and say <laughs> Jerry on a Plate. <laughs> That's my, one of my favorite accents, by the way. I love I loved Japan. I would love yeah. to visit Japan... There's something about that culture that is very orderly. Yes. But they have this sort of underlying weird darkness. Have you ever, like, read their manga? Like, Oh, yeah. Well, I, I, yeah, I don't want to get into. Uh, yeah. yeah we but, better finish this show. Yeah. But no, I, I uh, guess what? I really want to go to Japan someday. Me too. Yeah. Thanks so much to our patrons, past and present, for your pledges. We really appreciate your support of the show. If you want to help support the show, you can do so at patreon.com slash darkpatine, or for a one-time support, you can send us donut money via PayPal at our email address, darkpatinepodcast at gmail.com. We accept Interact as well. If you don't already, it would mean a lot to us if you subscribe to the show. You can easily find us on iTunes, Podcast, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, or wherever you get your on-demand audio. Check out darkpatine.com for show notes and other cool stuff. Please give us a follow or a like. 
on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Just search for Dark Poutine. Most importantly, tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is a powerful thing. Until next week, don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. Bye-bye, everybody. Good night. Oh, you have sleep apnea. <laughs>